can see what's grown from this system that supports it. Does that make sense? And so what we're doing, what we're doing on the divine love path is we're getting to the real root of things all the time, the stuff that's underneath. Now that's not going to be a process that's simple because we've spent all of our time covering that up, <laughs> haven't we? We've spent all of our life trying to cover that up so we don't see it. We only want people and ourselves to see this, right? And it's painful. And, and so, yeah, we start digging around the roots and we go, wow, that root goes way out there. Where, where, where does that root go? Like, we start travelling around like, and we start seeing that it, it's like a long way away, <laughs> right? And, and the truth is with our emotions, if you expect to process blocks of emotions all at once, you're going to probably be severely disappointed because what will happen is that there'll be emotion that you start processing that has all these tentacles that you'll follow bits off at one sitting of an emotional process. process. Yeah, you will actually process a bit of and you might process four or five parts of it even in one sitting, but it's highly unlikely you're going to get to the entire lot in one sitting. People come up to me and they say, yeah, I'm done with that now. And I say, how did you do that? <laughs> oh, yesterday I had an hour's crying and I realised I've dealt with all of this issue with my dad now. And I'm going, well, that's pretty good. Like, I was crying and you've dealt with all of your dad issues. I doubt that very much because, you know, you might have dealt with a little bit of the root system but there's, there's going to be more and more and more. And as your awareness grows, so does your awareness of how far the root system extends. And so the example that you give us in that you explain that you've cried for seven years, for example, or that you've processed one emotion that took three or four weeks, that then is a true example of what is required in general. It's specific to you it's specific in that to it took three weeks. Yeah, and it may take you long two days. Peri but long periods of time. Yeah. Okay. And can I um, talk about the emotion surrounding that question, Jen, which is an emotion that I have felt a lot that, when am I ever going to be done? I'm just going to have to cry for the rest of my life. This is terrible. <laughs> How many of you have got that emotion playing right now, right? Yeah. There's, and there's, like, you feel like swearing at AJ and say, bugger AJ, right? He's just shown me this stuff and now I'm an emotional wreck. And, and look, everybody around me thinks I'm an emotional wreck. And I, you know, but we need to take stock and yeah. see that we've actually got a good law of attraction happening and it's changing. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. But. Yeah. No, that's all right. I just wanted to um, s relate some of my personal experience around that emotion. At the moment, I, there's a lovely process happening for me around feeling like I am just returning to my authentic self anyway. So I'm, this is how God created me to be an emotional being and, and experiencing joy in connecting to the grief because I can feel that that's in me anyway and I've been resisting it like hell for most of my life. Um, but that's taken me a while. I had to deal with, like a lot of my blocks were just around being emotional. I oh, can't lie around and cry all day, you never get anything done, you know. So I had to, I, it's, it's taken me a long time to work through all those those resistances I had to being emotional and it's some of the stuff that I want to address in the workshops that are coming up the belief systems we have around different emotions and just being emotional and how that can get us caught up how that can actually shut us down and, and even I, process the feeling like this is never going to end and I'm never going to get there because that's an emotion I've I, been scared to death of having that label for want of a better word of being crazy because you're always emotional now. Yeah. <coughs> mm. yeah. I just want to address something from yesterday. Mary put her heart on the line a lot yesterday, right? Yeah. And she was very, very teary while she was talking to you about her life. Now, you should have felt your emotions about that because many of you were projecting at Mary, oh, we just want to hug you. <laughs> like, uh, and, and, and I what? felt, okay, I'm doing my stuff. I'm connecting with who I am. This is it. And she felt fine but you were actually wanting to shut her down. Because of why? Because when she was being very teary, what was going on inside of you? Yeah, you're starting to feel all sorts of different emotions inside of yourself, right? And so, and so now you're feeling a bit panicky and you're feeling, oh, oh, poor Mary, poor Mary, isn't this terrible? No, this is not poor Mary. This is actually Mary doing her stuff, you know, that she needs to do. And by the way, which you will need to do. You see, often when Mary goes into a state of vulnerability, a lot of people start treating her condescendingly, 
and by the way, it happens with me too, when we go into a state of vulnerability, people then treat us condescendingly or, we, or feel that, oh, we shouldn't have those emotions or there's these projections of... Um, yeah. Go on. Yeah, Which so. demonstrates some of the beliefs we have around being emotional. If yeah. you're emotional, you're weak. If you're emotional, you need to be protected. If you're so there's a whole lot to go into there around um, your own blockages, your own blockages to being an emotional person. Yeah. Who are we up to? Right. Okay, I have two things. Um, one of them is just a question, and that is as you reach that 22nd level, what's it going to be like for us to be around you if we're not in that higher frequency? Will we be around you? Well, um, well many of you are already uncomfortable being around me, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to intensify if you don't deal with your emotions about it. Um, the truth is that many of you would be highly uncomfortable being, you'd be crying all the time that you're around somebody who is in a, even in an one state. You'd be, just be crying all the time if you let yourself feel your emotions. Now, if you're not prepared to do that, then it's going to be quite triggering, right? There'll be lots of anger flying out and all sorts of things being really upset. So it just depends on our own humility as how we'll feel about it. You'll feel an immense amount of love coming from any person who's in that state. But our ability to receive that love is totally dependent upon our emotional injuries. So, for example, all of you are starting to see how important truth is in love, right? Like you see that speaking the truth at all times is a loving act, right? You're starting to see that. Now, how many of you before knowing that thought that speaking the truth at all times was a loving act? Most of us thought, well, you know, we've got to bend the truth here, a little white lie there, make them feel comfortable. You know what I mean? We go down that track, right? Now, now, if a person on the receiving end just wants you to make them feel nice, so on the receiving end, I'm sitting here, oh, I feel bad, I feel bad, please make me feel nice, please make me feel nice, and then you come along and tell them some truth that they don't want to hear and they get angry, you were just in a state of love, but how did they feel it? They felt it like, you are a terrible person, I don't like you, you're a hateful person, how dare you say those things to me? Do you know what I mean? This is what we feel inside of ourselves. So quite often, we perceive loving acts as very, very unloving behaviour. And, and obviously, if that's the feeling we have within us, the more loving people around us become, the more triggered we're going to be by them, the more stressed out we're going to be being in their company. So the truth is I won't leave you ever. The truth is that you may at very many times leave me for lots of different reasons. Okay. Because if you think about it, the, the state of it one moment means that you are loving in the same way that God loves. So all of the blockages you have around receiving God's love will immediately be triggered by that person. Okay. And that segues right into my next question. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. You're not hearing the answers. Oh. Emotionally. Why, why is that? Why do you feel that's going on? Because um, you, you were actually thinking about your next question rather than pondering about what Mary had just stated to you. That's true. So, so what's happening there, do you think? Well, uh, the next question was going to be addressing that the only time you're not I going feel... To get, you're not going to get an opportunity to ask the next question unless you deal with this with me right now. It's about the chaos in me. Okay. It's my next question. So what, what, is, what, do you need, <laughs> what do you need to do rather than ask the next question? Um, not ask it. Not ask it and instead do what? Um, just give the mic away, I guess. I don't know. No, no, I don't no, know no, what no, you want. No. It's, never do, it's, it's to do with feelings. Okay. Right? So what do you need to feel? What does chaos feel like to you? Um, when we were in the car on the way home last time, I said that was the only time I was really connecting with God. When you're in chaos. Was when I was in chaos. That's yeah. what I'm trying to say. And what are you afraid of with chaos? What, what's the thing with chaos? You go into deep fear about chaos. Yeah. Why? I'm not sure. That was what I wanted to address. You are sure? I'm sure. Yep. You know why you go into deep fear about chaos. Why? Uh, it's out of control. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. And what do you need to start learning to do? To give up control. To feel the feeling of being out of control. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So no, no more might for you. Okay. <laughs> and I want you to feel the feeling of being out of control. Does that make sense? Right now, just allow yourself to feel that feeling that's there, present in you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so Shannon. Right up. Um, I just have a question about um, the at one minute state. Um, so while you become an at one with God while you're here on earth, can you choose, like, what about the death and passing? Like, can you choose your death and passing? Like, how does all that work? Well, you're still governed by God's laws of your physical body, obvious. Like, you're never going to transcend God's laws. So God's laws say that if you're stabbed in the heart, you die. However, there are other laws that are activated because you're so in harmony with love. You have an increased capacity to heal, for example. So you're governed by the laws as well as by knowing higher laws, you can heal yourself better. You can, your desire is much stronger because everything is in harmony with, with God's laws. Your law of attraction is, is pretty good. <laughs> um, but so, if you were mortally injured in so, a very so severe way... So somebody come along and chop my head off. He's going to lose I'm, his I'm physical body pass. and be in spirit form. However, if someone did something less fatal um, and he was able to heal himself a lot... Like, he would be able to heal himself a lot quicker than well, he can probably. now. Yeah. Does that answer your question? So then you do get to choose your passing. You okay. get to choose yeah. when you discard your physical yeah. so body. So you get to choose it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But obviously I, I, I don't harm the free will of others, even if no. the free will of others is they want to murder me. Yeah. Which is the reason why I passed in the first century. Because yep. somebody wanted, a whole group of people wanted to murder me and they went ahead and did it. So I passed. I wasn't going to harm their free will by trying to stop them from doing it. Yeah. Right. All I can do is focus on my own emotions about it as a result. I know that passing is not a problem. I know that the spirit world life is just as, uh, is better. See, many of us here believe, still believe that life on earth is better than life in the spirit world, right? The truth is that life here is just a subset of what's really going on in the universe. And you will grow as a being as you pass. So no matter how bad your condition is, Right, you'll find that there are certain advantages to the spirit world than here. However, if you're in an atonement condition, you will be able to experience those things in a seamless manner. So you, you, will, you know, it's like it's like you can flick between your spirit body and your material body at any time you want. You can you can talk to people in the spirit world or here on earth. Doesn't really matter. In whatever condition, doesn't matter. So everything is seamless. So you wouldn't have a fear about your own death anyway. Does that make sense? Who's next, mate? Uh, Ivana. Ivana. And Alex. And then Alex, yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I've got two questions. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> sorry. Um, so the first one's about truth and speaking truth. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've said um, to do with whether or not the people want to actually hear the truth. Um, is it... Like, um, do you have to ask the person if they want to hear the truth? Um, like, I'm just trying to work out if it's loving or unloving. Well, to speak don't the forget truth all the time. about being loving to yourself, Ivana. So, if you're in a situation where something's going on and you can feel that something's out of harmony with love, there's an issue of love of yourself as well if you don't speak the truth. Okay. So you, as you get closer to God, you're always going to be acting more in harmony with God's truth. So if you, it's a, you can damage your soul by not speaking truth, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's look at any situation. See, the problem with examining situations is we have a tendency to do it intellectually rather than going by our emotion in the first place. But let's examine a situation. I'm in a situation where nobody wants to hear the truth and, and they're projecting at me, don't you tell any truth, right? Now, I'm in the situation where I want to be in truth. Now, what would love do? Walk away or speak your truth and then see how the other people react and if you're not happy with that, then walk away, maybe. So can you see that there are a lot of different options, choices that I have that might be 
harmonious with love. Can you see that? Yep. In that situation, I might have two or three different options that are harmonious with love that I could choose to do. And what I would do is allow myself to feel about those options and feel about what I feel is the best option for everyone involved. If I'm afraid of my own welfare in that situation, can you see straight away I'm out of harmony with love, no matter what I do? So if I choose to walk away because I'm afraid of my own welfare, I would have been better off staying there, telling the truth, and triggering the emotions that cause me to be afraid of my own welfare. Can you see that? Uh, right? So, so, that so, yeah. so, so can you see how sometimes the situation will demand me to stay when I'd rather go, even? if I loved myself. And you see, this is why it's so important just to feel, because when you feel, you will know what was the right per thing to do in that particular situation. Now, I've got to be honest with myself also in this situation. Why do I want to leave when the reality is that I'm not afraid of dying or I'm not afraid of ridicule and I'm not, a, I'm not afraid of people rubbishing me or treating me like I'm crazy? If I'm not afraid of any of those things, why would I want to leave? <laughs> Right? To avoid your emotions? Well, maybe. Or, or it might be because I've already tried giving them truth and they've rejected it and so I leave or because they, I can feel they're treating me unlovingly and so I leave. So can you see, even in that situation, there might be quite a number of different options I have that are harmonious with love and truth. Yeah. So God doesn't make rules about, oh, in this situation, you've got to do this particular thing. What God has done is gives you the heart of love. So, and that heart of love, by the way, ends up with a heart of love towards yourself as well as towards others. So you will never compromise love of yourself and you will never compromise love of others in your decisions. However, you have a wide variety of decisions in any one circumstances that are harmonious with love of self and harmonious with love of others that you could follow. So quite often in the first century I was asked questions by Pharisees who had no desire to hear the truth whatsoever. And yet I still answered them. Why did I do that? Because firstly, I had a desire to speak the truth. Secondly, there were a whole group of people listening. Not the Pharisees, they weren't listening. They were, just, they were just trying to trick me or had a lot of ulterior motives. But there were a whole lot of other group of people around me who might want to hear this issue and had a heart open to hearing it. And so I was in that situation, you, know, you can feel your own emotions and feel the situation. And as you do that, what happens is you automatically act harmonious with love in that situation. Can you see? And as you become more sensitive to yourself, Ivana, you'll, you'll, like, don't, you don't have to get it right the first time, you know? You'll walk away from a situation and go, oh, actually, I just avoided something there, so yeah, I'll know I've next time. Yeah, I've done that many times. Yeah. <laughs> or you'll, you'll say the truth to someone <laughs> and then you go, oh, actually, I was angry and I really wanted them to have that truth. So it's, you're just going to go through a process and in the end, it's like what we were saying yesterday. You, there's no rule book. You don't have to follow any rule book. As, you, as your heart and soul expands, you'll know intuitively what's the thing to do. Yeah. And the, the other thing with it too is that you will often feel um, impelled to do the, the, a certain thing by the love that's in you. So instead of fear impelling us, most of the time fear impels us in our decisions today. But as we progress closer and closer to God, it's love that impels us in any situation. So we're not worried anymore about our personal safety, the safety of our loved ones or anything else. We're now just focused on love of myself, love of others, love of God, and, and we don't compromise in that situation. And so we're in that, within that framework, there's an unlimited number of choices that we actually have. And, and that's the beauty of what God's created, is that, that the more we practice love, the more freedom we have. Okay, thank you. You had a second question? Oh, yeah, I did, but I just realised that I don't really need to ask it. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah, Alex. <coughs> it's getting a bit warm now. Can we just whack on the air cons? Uh, it's just a matter of pressing the buttons. I've already, I've already um, set them at 26 degrees, which should be... Uh, there's a red button on the Thanks, Vina. Far away, my friend. Um, <clears throat> I just want to apologise to you firstly because I was very resentful of you yesterday and I've been very angry. Yeah. And um, can I've I, been... Can I ask why, Alex? Uh, 
I don't know. I'm right. processing a lot of stuff at the moment around powerlessness and yep. and that sort of stuff. And I'm I'm connecting to a lot of angry spirits. Yeah. And so you're not sure whether you're actually living in the angry emotion with these spirits or what the emotion was within yourself at this point. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I went to do some mediumship homework the other day mm. and I connected to a very angry spirit and I was s s talking to them about um, what it is that they need to do to progress in the spirit world mm. and, and, and do all that and um, we were actually crying together by the end of it which yeah. was really good yeah. but I'm, um, I, don't, I don't know what's motivating this question now. Um, I guess it's a fear, it's a fear coming up now. They've, they've got a lot of fears, and this is my fear actually, that um, I'm not receiving any of God's love at all. I see my soulmate, she cries for 10 minutes and she's in a state of bliss, and I just get go away, and I just, <laughs> and I cry for nine hours, I cried for nine hours straight one day and felt nothing. And so this morning I was just, I was just in total rage with God, yeah. feeling oh, I received none of your love. Yeah. I want to get off this path. Yeah. This is pointless. I'm wasting my time. Yeah. I was just really, really angry. Yeah. And actually that's the source of some of your anger with me as well. Mm. Okay. Cause, because I've talked to you about a path that your soulmate's finding quite easy and mm. you're finding quite difficult. And if I can, there's a number of issues you've raised, Alex, that, that need to be dealt with. One is that if you're crying for nine hours about an issue, an issue then it's highly, l and, and not actually receiving divine love afterwards or during, it's highly likely that the issue is an issue of self-deception. Right? So in other words, it's an emotion you'd prefer to feel rather than the real emotion. So that's the key thing to look at there. What kind of, what would be that emotion be covering over? And as you've correctly identified, if you've got rage towards God, obviously you can't receive love from somebody you've got rage towards generally unless you get to the underlying emotion of, of what triggers that rage. So it's great that you're working through that. Um, the reason why um, Monique has a lot less difficulty with uh, dealing with some of these issues is because she, does, she, she is a person who does find the causal emotion quite easy to access. And as a result of that, um, can receive divine love after the causal emotion is released or during the release of that emotion. The key is to not judge yourself by her progression because that's one of the things you are doing. And, we say, well, and then many of you are doing this, right? You look at somebody else and you go, they, you know, they've changed heaps. Like, oh, I feel like I haven't changed at all. What's going on? This is right. like, what's wrong with me? Well, that's an emotion. I need to work my way through the what's wrong with me emotion compared to other people. But understand it's actually a self-harming emotion right? and the self-harming emotions are like any other harming emotions. A lot of people don't realise this, perhaps they just need to draw that up. Um, maybe I need to use another colour now. <laughs> I'll just use a green one or whatever. Um, remember at the base there's the grief, right? Above the grief, there's the fear. Above the fear, there's the anger usually, right? So whenever we're in this angry place, we, are, we do one or two things with our anger. We either internalise the anger or externalise the anger. Now, when we internalise the anger, we go into self-hatred, self-blame, self-punishment. You follow that? When we externalise the anger, we go into blame of the other person, blame of, and sometimes we do both, like externalise and internalise our anger. But understand that all anger, whether it's anger with me or somebody else here or with yourself, is just as debilitating as each other. In other words, it's just an, uh, as unloving act to be angry with yourself as it is for you to be, have an unloving act of being angry towards someone else. Can you see that? From God's perspective, you have the same value as everyone else here in the auditorium. So if you're angry with yourself, that's just the same as you being angry with somebody else. It has the same effect on your soul, by the way. It doesn't help you release causal emotion. The reason why we always get angry is because we are afraid. 
So allow yourself to start feeling some of these fears that you have. The fear that I'm never going to get this. The fear that God doesn't love me. Which is a part of the reason why you're angry with God. You see, being angry with God is just as ineffectual as being angry with yourself or angry with someone else. Right? Because in the end it doesn't let yourself feel what the real emotion is, that I'm afraid that God doesn't love me. And what's that covering over? Deep grief about the fact that I feel God doesn't love me. That's what that's covering over. So let yourself see your anger as a mechanism that you use to either punish yourself or punish others or punish God for something that you're just afraid of in a deeper, in a deeper sense. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I've just been feeling like there's no point even praying because like, if I don't feel like I receive love, then why am I praying? Well, that's one of the griefs you have. Can you see that? Like, remember everything that we go through like this is an emotion and we need to allow ourselves to experience it. So I'm praying and I'm receiving no love. How many of you feel like that? Praying, receiving no love. Right? Quite a lot. Half, half, three quarters of our audience. Right? Praying, receiving no love. All right. There must be a reason why I'm not receiving the love. Agreed? Right? But, but because we're so afraid of finding that reason, we then project anger at God or anger at ourselves. Or at AJ. Or at AJ or anybody else, right? Uh, you know, we wish that we never heard about the path now. But all it is is it, it's exposing the fact that we have a deeper fear, an emotional block, towards some grief that we have within ourselves. So what would the grief be, do you feel, in this situation? Like you pray, you pray, you pray, but you're not receiving divine love. What's the grief? What's the feeling of grief? Remember, your anger is telling you the direction in which it, it lays. So what, who have you been angry with? Uh, my mother. Well, let's start at the top. Oh, God. God. Okay. <laughs> right? so, so you're angry with God, right? So some of this grief has to relate to God. You're praying to God, aren't you? And yet not receiving divine love. And, then is, and instead of receiving divine love, you're now getting angry with God. So that means you have an expectation that God gives you her love under your conditions. Does everyone follow that? Yeah. Remember, anger is coming always from expectations and usually it's an expectation of something that we want in our way, right? And we don't want to give that up. Now, if you think about much of your life, you've had a lot of things your way, if you think about it, Alex, and, and now things are changing to not be your way and it feels pretty... Yeah, I'm actually working through a lot of control and powerlessness issues. Exactly, as well. exactly. So, so what, when you're praying for divine love and not receiving it, understand that if there was a sincere desire for you to receive divine love, you will always actually get it. The fact that you have anger towards God when you don't receive it means that the desire wasn't sincere in the first place. There has to be some other emotion going on that you're unwilling to face and allow yourself to investigate that. So you may have a lot of tears about the fact that you feel God doesn't actually love you anyway, so what's the point? What's the point of praying for love from somebody who doesn't love you anyway? No point, right? That's what you'll feel inside. And, uh, and the truth is, if someone doesn't love you anyway, well, what is the point? It's no good asking someone for love who's not going to give you that love. Right? And that's very much related to, as you said, your parents. Uh, right? The second person you've blamed is who? Uh, you? Yeah, okay. So, so, so you blame God first, right? Like, did God respond very well to that blame? Like, did you receive no. divine love no. after you got through blaming God? No. No, no, okay. Then you went to blaming AJ. That's the next thing. Most people do this, by the way. And that really hurt because, like, yesterday's talk didn't relate to me at all. Yeah. I, I felt because I've loved you, like, my whole life, and I hate the fact that I, I was resenting you. Yep. Okay. Why do we go from blaming God to blaming AJ? Many of people do this, by the way. Why do we do that? Well, see, one of them you can't see and you can't actually have a nice feeling, satisfaction feeling of he's going to feel this, right? From God, like, like while God feels all of your emotions and knows what they are, your anger doesn't enter God, right? It just bounces right off, right? But then, see, AJ's a person you can see. Now, this is, this is a lot more convenient, isn't it? 
now what I can do is I can project anger and rage and there's a good chance AJ is going to feel it, right? Which means I get a bit of satisfaction out of it. Does that make sense? From an emotional perspective, I get some satisfaction out of that. So that's why that's my next step. Who was your next person? Uh, my mother. No, it wasn't. It was Monique. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it? Yeah. His partner, right? Why, why is she next? Because she can be. She's there connecting with God, having no yeah, trouble with right. it, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. what is in you? This is, this is jealousy and mm. um, resentment. Resentment yeah. and right, all of that. Can you see she's another person who you can, she's a person who can feel some of this rage within you and she can notice it. So there's a good, good mechanism there to project it at her. When you do either of these things, you are not letting yourself feel the fear of how strong your grief is about the issue that God maybe doesn't love you at all. And remember, coming from your past, the, the problem with the addiction that's been established for you is coming from the past, you've been into this real Zen uh, state in the past, haven't you? And you've had, these, you've had these natural love spirits just pouring love into you at times, right? So, so what's been happening in your life a lot, all you needed to do is just go a little bit out of body, you just have all of these spirits just pouring their love into you. It's been an instant satisfaction. I've had instant satisfaction. I haven't had to deal with a single emotion to get this instant satisfaction. Isn't that wonderful? But what it's done is it's established an addiction. The addiction is that I can go ahead and get love from anybody I want without having to deal with anything inside of myself. And that addiction is very contrary to what God feels about love of you. God actually feels that that's not loving to yourself, let alone anyone else. And this is the problem with many people who have established very close rapport with spirits in the past through the acts of meditation or through the acts of you know, doing out-of-body experiences or those kind of things, is they've become so addicted to that process right, that in the end what happens is that they now have this deep expectation that God is going to satisfy them in exactly the same manner that these spirits are satisfying them. And that's the trouble is many of these natural love spirits don't understand the damage they're doing to the person's soul in giving them this satisfaction without having an emotional part in the process. So that's a, something that is an emotion within you that you'll need to allow yourself to work through and release. Does that make sense? And this is why at times you'll attract angry spirits because the, ang the spirits also have the same rage towards God. I can't get this instant satisfaction from God that I can get from other people. Do you, do you see that? And they might be in a second, third, fourth fear state still trying to get instant satisfaction, right? And in many of their relationships getting that satisfaction but still being very frustrated with God about the process when they ever try to connect with God. So they give up. They say, oh, God doesn't exist. You know, God's not a part of the process. You know, in the end we're all God anyway and they go down that track, right? And they detune emotionally from all of that and they get into this intellectual space where they're loving and they give love and, and in reality they've still got these emotions towards God to work their way through. Right? And those kind of spirits would happily give you their love. But you've been through all of that and you know that it's not a permanent solution. So, so just allow yourself to work through this grief with God that you have, which is actually as you correctly identify grief with your parents um, and the fact that whenever you, you know, that you didn't get much love from your parents. Mm. Can I give an analogy about the divine love path that um, our friend Fiona, I think she, I don't know if she channeled it or she just uh, observed it. Um, because I see lots of people comparing with other people or somebody comes up the front with AJ who's suddenly channeling a spirit and oh my gosh, none of us are good, as good as them or whatever. There's loads of comparison. And Fiona told me this analogy about we're all on this motorway, right? It's got lots of lanes. It's a, it's a one-way motorway. And God's at the end. And some of us just seem to be in the fast lane and we're going and going and going and others of us are in the slow lane and it seems like everything's a block and I'm not getting anything and that God's so far away and I'm just... And some of us, like, uh, even we're in it for a bit and then we're just like, I'm off the motorway. I'm, I'm even broken down. I'm not going, I'm not going anywhere. Um, but what, what I have seen happen very often is that some people hit the motorway and they're in the fast lane 
And then all of a sudden they, they crash into like the car of their soulmate or something and suddenly they're both over there in the slow lane <laughs> going much slower. And other people who were working through their blocks, working through their blocks, suddenly shoot across five lanes and they're, they're on fire. And you've seen that happen with different people in the group. And some people like, some people go off road and just never come back. <laughs> But the further that you are along the motorway, even if you go off-road, it's very hard to stay off-road, in my opinion, because the more you connect with God, the harder it is to stay away. Mm. So, but we're all, we're all manufactured in the same factory and we're all equally loved by the maker, you know. Mm. We're just... Uh, some of us seem to go really well and then we hit something that's really difficult and then we're going to have to go back to the slow lane for a while. And some of us are just middle, middle achievers and we're just gradually going and going and going. So all this judgment about, oh, they get it and I don't get it. and it's, it's all, everyone's journey is unique and beautiful and it's all going to be a personal relationship with God. So don't get caught up in this whole big comparison thing. Some of us have got different gifts and some of us have got gifts we haven't even uncovered yet. So we're, we're all going to get there. So, as as so the truth is there is one way to God. Like God created the one way to God. But um, many of us will progress in all sorts of fashions on that one way, right? depending on what our emotional blockages are. I've seen some people two years go fantastically, like they really progress and progress and they're getting, into, like you, you can really feel that they've made some shifts into truth and harmony with truth and so forth. And then all of a sudden they hit one big issue like rejection from a partner. And bang, they come to a screaming halt in their progression because they just don't want to deal with that particular issue inside of themselves. So on the path, the beauty of this path is that God will test your humility through the, the, the path tests your humility, basically. And it's not like God's trying to force you into this being humiliated place, which is a lot of what a lot of people believe. But God's trying to help you be become what, you, what she created you to be. And that is a very humble child of God who's able to be taught everything. That's what God's created. And the path is the path that gets you to that place of being that very humble child of God. Does that make sense to everyone? And when you're in that place, that's when you make the most progression for yourself. But just because someone else seems to be going better at the moment, it doesn't mean in a week's time they might come to a screaming halt. Right? And comparison in itself is a judgment. It's, either, it's born out of judgment of self and it, in the end it, it turns into judgment of others. Right? And we need to just give up all judgment. And down the track we'll be actually, myself and Mary will be giving a talk about judgment and truth and the difference between truth and judgment uh, just to help you separate what it means to hear truth compared to what it means to be judged. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> put, all put your hands up again. Uh, what happened was quite a few people put their hands up and they all looked around at each other having their hands up and then they all put their hands back down again. <laughs> so put your hands back up again so we can make a choice. <laughs> Who hasn't had a go? We met in a different way. If you hold the microphone more towards your mouth. Okay, That's we it. met each other in a very different way than some others, as you know. And my life has been difficult, but praise has always saved me. Yep. When uh, you said to us to read the pageant, pray, I felt a lot, a lot of love around me, like a very warm feeling. And when I read the pray, I cried to every single word. Yeah, yeah. And I was so touched that such a love was there. Uh, and I could not stop crying. Was that part of my injury or is it just because I felt close to God at that time? And, but sometimes I do still read the prayer, and 
it seems is different. I cannot cry. Yeah. Would you be able to explain that to me? Um, often what happens initially is that when we start reading the prayer, so many parts of our soul just opens, opens up, like our soul expands. And as that happens, then lots of love can flow into us. And as that love flows into us, we're often over... Every time I receive divine love, generally I cry anyway. And so... so um, and I still do that. I have most of my life. But um, as that love enters you, like, obviously, you just feel overwhelmed with that love entering you and your soul just continues to expand. The issue, though... Are you talking about emotions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> And, um, but what often happens is after that first initial reaction where our soul is opened, we receive love, is that we finish up um, confronting an emotional blockage within ourselves to receiving more. So what happens is that uh, when you start on the path... <coughs> I'm going to have a cough. Sorry about that. When you start on the path, if you can think of it... And I've used this analogy before, so you have like a big bottle of water with a lid on the, on the bottom, let's say. And initially, uh, we haven't got any opening at the top here because we're totally blocked off to love from every place around us, usually, because of all the different emotional injuries that have occurred in our life. But then after a while, what happens, we start establishing a, a way for love to enter us, so that this way for love to enter us is there. But unfortunately, we have all of this emotional baggage that prevents love, which you could think of as water, right, entering, entering the top of the container, which is our soul. Now, when we first open up to the love, we have some space in our soul for it, generally. And what happens is we receive quite a large inflow of love in that first instance. And so many people have experienced this large inflow of love in the very first instance they've asked for divine love, or read the prayer for divine love. But then what happens is God's basically filled up all of the gaps in our soul with her love. Now, we ask for love again, and what's going to happen now? There's no room for love to enter anymore because we're still yet to release the emotional baggage that prevents the love from entering. To release the emotional baggage, we have to undo some things. We have to be humble enough to actually let some of the emotional prevention of love, from, to, we need to let it go. And that's when most people come to grief on the divine love path. So what happens on the divine love path, and this happens, by the way, in a lot of born-again Christian religions, as well as people who know about the divine love path through what they've read from the pageant messages and so forth, is they long for God's love to enter them. God's love enters them, and they feel this overwhelming emotional experience that is undeniable, right? But then they never receive that, they never feel that again. Now, at that stage, most people do one of two different things. One is they start longing for love from spirits. And there are many natural love spirits who would be totally willing to try to give you their love, but it's a temporary thing because it can't actually enter you because there's no space for it to really enter you. So what happens is you're overwhelmed with an emotional experience that's temporary and a hour or two later you're back to being the same unloving person you were before it began. Does that make sense? And, or the alternative is to give up altogether and say, oh, well, God must be receiving divine love even when you're not. So there's a lot of people on the divine love path who believe they've been on the path for 30 years and they believe they've been receiving divine love every day when they haven't been receiving divine love except for the very first time or the, or the second time that they did it. Right? but they want to tell themselves they are because otherwise they'd feel terrible and so they tell themselves they've been receiving love all that time. By their actions, you can easily see that they haven't been because as soon as their anger gets triggered, bang, they're in a rage. You know, There are so many people on the divine love path in this huge rage with me at the moment. They all say they're on the divine love path, but if they're on the divine love path, would you ever be in a rage with anybody? Let it, like... It doesn't matter whether I'm saying I'm Jesus or not. At the end, would you be in a rage with me? You wouldn't be because you'd be in a state where you are more loving yourself. So, so what the problem is is that most of them are avoiding this process of releasing the, the neg what you could classify as, but I don't necessarily believe it is, the negative 
or painful emotions that we have within us that prevent the love from flowing. Now, what we need to all make a choice to do at some point is to access those emotions. Because initially you will receive some divine love generally when you ask for it. But that process cannot continue without stop until you begin the process of releasing the negative emotions within you. Now, a lot of people have this belief that somehow when divine love enters you, God automatically rubs out these negative emotions. God can only do that if you're willing to release them. God can't do that if you're not willing to experience them. The only time God can do it is when you use your will to release. Right? And this is one of the major things that most people on the Divine Love Path have no comprehension of really. But we alluded to it in the pageant messages in almost every message. And if you read the pageant messages from a strong emotional background, you will start seeing that we always talk about passions, desires, longings, intentions, all the soul-based things. And we always talked about... A lot, and we, in fact, there were messages where we said that a lot of people think they're receiving divine love and they've never received it. Right? Because we want to often tell ourselves we are... Whoops. Sorry about that. We want to tell ourselves that we are when, when, because we have a lot of emotions that Alex is now going through, that he's being honest, that he's not receiving it, and it feels terrible, right? And we want to avoid that group of emotions. And so we tell ourselves, oh, no, we are actually. We are actually receiving divine love. And we tell everyone we've been on the path for 30 years. And my question is, if you've been on the path for 30 years, then why aren't you at one with God yet? You've got to start asking that question, don't you? Like, really, if you're on the path for 30 years, you've got to ask, start asking the question whether what you think you're doing on the path is actually the path. And that's where most people don't make that statement. So what's happened for yourself is exactly that. God topped you up with her love. Now there's some emotional work for you to do to release, to let go of some things so that God can top you up some, with some more love. Does that make sense? But at the moment, you're Thank using you. your will to resist the releasing process. Yeah. It's a hard way. Yeah. So the, the hard part is getting to the blockages of this. So I often think of the hard part as the lid, <laughs> right? You see, we've got to unscrew that lid and that lid is on there by our own will. Nobody else can unscrew that lid for me. I've got to unscrew that lid. Now, for myself, it probably took, like, it took many years of my life to unscrew that lid. That was my blockages, all of my blockages towards God. How many years has it taken you since you've known about the divine love path? Two so far. I still wouldn't say the lid's all the way off. <laughs> See, things are dribbling out now, but yeah. not rushing yet, right? Does that make sense? So for many people, it takes two, three years to undo that lid, right? And during that time, that is the time when you feel the most discouraged. Can you see why? Because you're un you haven't undo this lid, and it's an emotional process, right? Because the, the lid is there for all of the emotional reasons to try to block these emotions. And we're trying to undo the lid, but, but because it's such an emotional process, it takes a bit of time. And, and because it takes time, we get despondent. And the key is to never give up with the blocks. Once you start releasing enough blocks, the lid will start dribbling and then it will start... And then when you take it off completely, it'll just start flowing out. So you've seen some of the people here who, you know, they start asking a question and whoosh, they're off and they're down in the processing room. They don't hear half of the presentation, right? Then they come back and whoosh, they're off again sort of thing. The reason why is because their lid is a lot more freely opened to their emotional experience. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there were a lot of... Uh, uh, we haven't asked Dave, and if we then come down the front after Dave. So, uh, up the back there first. What's the time? Okay, fine. Uh, firstly, AJ, an apology, and, and then a couple of questions. Um, firstly, I'd like to apologise for my projections at you on Friday afternoon. Yep. Um, to be honest, I, my initial response was I had no idea. Yep. Uh, but when I thought about it, it was a case uh, I'd made a choice not to recognise the signs. Yeah. So I, I apologise for that. It was 
and I realised that it was um, you probably just wanted to be here to have fun. You didn't want to deal with any of that sort of stuff, and you cop all that sort of crap all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's true. But um, what if I can go back to the events on Friday? Um, what I did with Dave is uh, Dave projected at me quite some quite needy emotions. And after about three or four times of it occurring in, in a space of about 20 minutes, um, I just grabbed hold of Dave, you know, by both shoulders, and I said, stop, Dave. You need to look at why you're doing this with me. What? And Dave said, what am I doing? I don't even know. And, he, and I said, well, you're projecting all of this needy emotions at me. You want my attention and approval for some reason. Why is that? All right? Now, you're not yet being honest about your response, my friend. Yesterday, what happened? Can you, can you remember what happened yesterday for you? Uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was umming and ahhing about whether to make an apology to you then. <laughs> yeah. As to, um, and I was, uh, I, was, I was scared of two things, at least. Mm -hmm. um, firstly, that, um, uh, that I may be projecting at you again. And secondly, that, um, that you would make me aware of more stuff than, than I already was. <laughs> Which well, he's now doing. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do now. <laughs> There's an emotion that you didn't own yesterday and still are not owning today. If you look at your actions yesterday, what, what happened yesterday? Can you remember? I, I think, and I was, I was going to ask you this in a moment, that I was um, in some fear, um, so I was sort of wasn't feeling terribly bright, wasn't feeling myself, wasn't even sure whether I should be here, and yep. I actually lay down up the back corner so that I, to try and minimise any projections to anyone else. So you went into the shutdown mode. Can you see that? Okay, I thought I was trying to just stay in my fear, but not not affect anyone else. Yeah, you went into shutdown mode. You wanted to not. You, you were worried about the projection to others and, in, and instead of involving yourself in day-to-day -day activity, you withdrew. Okay. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. You also went to sleep. Did I? And where did you go to sleep? On the floor. And you remember going down to the processing rooms? Yes. And you went to sleep down there? Um, yeah, I think I did now you mention it. Okay. Why did all these things happen? Can I explain? Sure. You have a deep, um, so let's look at the grief. So we've got, remember that we're talking about the grief and then we've got the fear and then we've got anger and then we've got suppression right, or depression. This has been a problem for you, hasn't it? Getting into depression or suppression. No, I've come to realise this weekend actually that um, uh, I didn't think I was a very fearful sort of a person or even an angry person. Yeah. But I've come to realise that I have a whole swag of fears. And I was saying to some of the others earlier that I did a fear list earlier in the week and it was only like eight or ten items. Yeah. Um, and now I could write out pages and pages of fear. Yeah. So you're being more honest with yourself. So that's wonderful. What's happening too is that here's you. You're quite mediumistic. And here's the spirits, some spirits with you. These spirits are addicted to the natural love path. Right? And so what's happening a lot when you're talking to other people is you're channeling a lot of their information that they're giving, quite accurate information at times, that, you, they, that you're give, giving through you. But there's a reason why you're doing that. You're addicted to the process of that occurring because you're trying to always get away from your own process. And so what you, do, what you were doing with me on Friday is you were coming along projecting at me because there's some big issues for you to face about taking full responsibility for your own process. Remember right from the time we first met, I've mentioned this to you, how often you would disclaim your own responsibility in preference to the spirit's desire. Right? And remember, that, remember how I was even concerned for your long-term uh, state of whether you could stay alive or not because of it. Because a lot of these spirits were leading you down paths which could have easily resulted in your own death, even. And I'm not afraid of your death, but what I'm saying is that they, weren't, they didn't have a loving feeling towards you. And, 
And that comes from a desire in you to get away from your own responsibility to exercise your own free will, to discover your own emotional issues. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. now, now what I'm suggesting to you is you're going to have to allow yourself now to start stepping down here. You believed up until recently that there was no anger within you. I'm not allowing myself to feel my anger. Exactly. Because what are the judgments about anger? Uh, anger is not a good thing to, to display and, and, and being an eldest child and all that sort of thing, you're supposed what? to be responsible. And what happened second. every time you got angry? You got into trouble for it. Yeah. yeah. Right, so there's a lot of judgment about anger and there's a, there is a, quite a, number, a lot of suppressed anger in you that comes from your childhood. Allow yourself to step down through that into what you were afraid of and then down through that into the actual grief. So, so what I would do is I would stop actually using your connection with spirits to tell other people things. I'd stop it completely if I was you. What I would do instead is use your connection with spirits to tell you about your own emotions. In other words, instead of being externalizing the gift that you have and, and you're doing that for a reason, it's to avoid your own emotions, Allow yourself to now look at your own emotions and help use the spirit connection that you do have to actually help you get into your own emotions rather than run away from them. At the moment, the heavy projections that come from you are, t are saying, I don't want to deal with my own stuff. I want you to help me. And you're projecting that at every person around you, not just me. Yeah. And that's a heavy burden for other people because they are actually responsible only for their stuff. So, so my suggestion is to really like, try to look at all of those addictive behaviours you have that get you away from that. These spirits are going to very much oppose you doing that. They like, you like the power they give you when they tell you things about other people, right? Because you feel, oh, I automatic... Like one of the first comments you ever made to me, I just seem to know people's lives so much. I just seem to know what they're going to do or what's going on in their life, aren't I wonderful, <laughs> right, is the underlying mm. implication. But in reality, all it is is the spirit giving you that power, right? And the problem with the spirit giving us those powers is that we become addicted to those powers in order to avoid our own castle of grief. Can you see that? And this is something that's going to be very difficult for you to work through getting away from actually focusing on other people's emotional condition and coming back to your own emotional condition every single time. Because these spirits are hooked into this feeling that it gives you. The, the feeling it gives you is one of I know things, isn't it? It's wonderful. I'm important. You know? can, can I come back to that in just a second? Yep. So there is a gift there, is there? Of course. Right, okay. But it's not appropriate and I haven't been using it entirely appropriately. You, you have not been using it in a loving manner to yourself or to others. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I, I should just, just not worry about that side and when it's appropriate further down the track, may, maybe then. No, no, I'd still use the gift. But now use it in a loving manner firstly towards yourself. In other words, Use it firstly as a mechanism to get into your castle of emotions. Does that make sense to you? I do, but I'm not quite sure how. Well, all you need to do is ask some spirits about your anger, for example. I realise now I've got anger. What, what am I angry about? Let, get some help from the spirit friends that you have to help you with your anger. Connect with what it's all about. So will they tell me the truth? Um, they may not, but it will still be a law of attraction event. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the beauty is if you stay open and connected with the spirits who are there, they may not tell you the truth and then how will you feel? I feel pretty, pretty annoyed and disappointed, etc. Yeah, the uh, law angry. of attraction event for your anger, you see. Okay. Can you see that? So even if they mislead you down a certain path, if you're staying focused on your emotion, you will be able to work through the causes. Okay? So I'm not saying tune out of spirits altogether. What I'm saying is Stop using it for the reason of making yourself feel good about yourself. Because actually you feel quite bad about yourself. Yeah. Right? Let yourself feel some of those emotions and find out what the underlying causes are. 
At the moment, these spirits are just manipulating how bad you feel about yourself in order to have their own ends met. And I, I hear where you're coming from. And I, I'm actually not used to asking for help for me. It's, it's always been, or, or feeling help for me, it's been feeling help for others. But you actually have a feeling that you don't need help. Uh-huh, okay. When in actual fact, Up I, until recently. Yeah. Yeah, up until recently, you felt like you want to help the others. You were in a good space. You want to help the others. Yep. Recently, you've started to found, find some deeper emotions, and you realise, actually, I do need some assistance too. But then you start projecting needy, ad addictive-type emotions at people who can help you. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And yeah. I've become aware that I've, I've actually been doing that for most of my life and yes. hadn't, hadn't realised it. Yep, and your wife has distanced herself as a result and yep. you can see people who have distanced themselves from mm. that really strong needy projection. So yep. that's the addiction. So let yourself go through the emotions of seeing that addiction and then look at what underlying emotions are there as a result. Okay, I, I have become aware of, of a lot of fear yep. but also having difficulty actually getting at it um, the past few days, I, I think I've been in some sort of minor fear process whereby my jaw's been chattering a little bit. It, is that for real? Yeah, but the problem you're facing is that these spirits want to shut down the process. This is why you slept most of yesterday or a lot of yesterday or you went into a zen out state yesterday a lot. If you think about it, after we had a chat on Friday, you also sort of went into that big withdrawn state that you would have done a lot when you were a child. Oh, I, I thought I was reflecting on it, but I was escaping. Yeah, and, and these spirits want you to escape from your emotions because if you, escape from, if you don't escape from your emotions and you actually deal with them, they won't have the same control over you as what they currently have. Yesterday in our presentation, we mentioned many people were yawning, like, and we talked about yawning and getting tired and all that, and a lot of that is driven by spirits who don't want you to hear the information that, that actually will open you up and cause their connection with you to be reduced. And the spirits with you are very frightened of that. Okay, and then there's plenty of them. <laughs> yep, and I'd be happy to answer some of their questions after the break about it. Yeah. Yep. Dave, can I, can I just say as well, I feel from you a big desire to get it right, to get approval. And I feel like the spirits with, like very often, that's why you get messages about other people because then you get it right. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And your projection at AJ is tell me I'm doing the right thing. Uh, did I get it right? And the big issue that you had a little while ago with the spirits was they were telling you the right thing to do and you felt like, oh, okay, I can do that then. Because there must be some stuff in your childhood about needing to get it right, getting approval if I do the right thing, like big stuff. And, and you're quite petrified about having your own desire. And getting it, it wrong. And getting it wrong. Okay, yeah. yeah. That and makes sense actually because, yeah, I, I, I have a tendency towards perfectionism yeah. Uh, and, yeah, really try and avoid to get it right, uh, really try and get things right the first time yeah. and not allow myself to make mistakes. Yeah, but the beauty of mistakes is that they often, you often learn a lot more from them than you do from getting things right. Yeah, I know that here, but... But you don't yeah. allow it emotionally to occur, yeah. So, so we allow, the key is to allow yourself to address some of those causal emotions from your childhood of what happened to you when you got it wrong. So when you say allow yourself to access the causal emotions... You're in a fear-based state about your causal emotions. Yeah. And you're going to have to look at that fear, those fear things quite a lot more than you currently are and you're going to have to allow yourself to, to visit the fear experientially as you're beginning to do, but understand that these spirits who are with you, they want to stop that process in you. They don't want you doing this. And so you've got, firstly, the emotional hook into these spirits that you will need to address. And the emotional hook into these spirits is the desire to know things about other people's lives, right? Because it gives you a sense that you are, you know... Important. Important and... and um, what is one of the things uh, that you have a role? You often come to me saying, what is my... Yeah, I, I have a need for, a, for an important life purpose. Exactly. And, and, so, and it's that desire that they're actually hooking into. In the end, when you give up that need for an important life purpose, 
they won't be able to hook into this emotion inside of you anymore. You'll start focusing on your own emotions and when you do that, these spirits, you'll actually start recognising your own life purpose, if you like, without having anyone else tell you. you. Remember one of the first questions you ever asked me is, please tell me what my life's purpose is. And remember what my answer was? I'm not uh, going to tell you. <laughs> I, from memory, it was look for issues in, in um, uh, suppressing my desires with my mother. Yeah. So, so I was pointing you back to the emotions that prevented you from seeing your own life purpose. Does that make sense? Yeah. So should I try and access childhood memories or just try and feel what's... Just feel everything as it current... One mistake many of you are still making is you're trying with your mind to do things that your law of attraction is showing you you don't even need to do because there's different things happening with your law of attraction. You just need to feel the events that are being triggered in your law of attraction as they occur. So me coming up to you and saying, David, is a law of attraction event for you. Saying, stop projecting needy emotions at me. Right? That's a law of attraction event for you. Allow yourself to feel about that. You know? And there was some rage in there that you suppressed by going to sleep. Oh, I had no idea. Mm. And you need to allow yourself to connect with some of that rage and then... Because I, I wasn't giving you the approval you were seeking. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. Now, I think it's, I think it's probably time, time for a break. break. So let's have a break. Come back around four-ish or so. And then we'll get on to the real subject. <laughs>